Hi, everybody, and welcome. So, I will be talking today about purging consensus. The title and the contents evolved a bit over time. So, I'm Robert, I'm lead developer at Parity Technologies, and I'm working, I've been working on purging consensus since 2020. And yes, so what will this talk be about? It will be about parachain consensus. I will give you an overview of what it actually is, and also look a bit into how it compares to rollups on Ethereum. So, let's set the stage a bit. For this, we will first look at Ethereum. So, Ethereum, as of now, has no sharding. Um, they had full sharding on the roadmap um, until October 2020. Then rollups became a thing, and it was scratched. And, previous, and the sharding that was planned was also homogeneous, so all shards would be identical when it comes to functionality, basically all running the EVM. What's still on the roadmap is data sharding, because it's still needed for rollups. And the roadmap says it's still several years away. So now. Let's look at Polkadot and the current state. Um, Polkadot has full data execution and heterogeneous sharding, and it's live since December 2021. So I think that's pretty cool. So let's have a closer look. What is parachain consensus? First of all, it's sharded. So the validation of all the shards of all the parachains is done by the, act, by the staked validators, which bring the economic security to the network. We have, we don't even trust them. We have a two-third honest assumption. So a full third could be entirely malicious. So we have a three-phase pessimistic validation of each and every parachain block. We do have sharded data availability via erasure-coded chunks. And we also have quite fast finality, which is usually just a couple of really chain blocks, and the block time is, current, is six seconds. We do also have external nodes, not validators, nodes that don't add to the economic security of the network. We call them collators. We need them for liveness in a limited fashion. We do have our data availability layer, so the liveness requirements are pretty low, but they exist. Good. So, how, how does this all work? A few concepts I already brought up. So, you have the relay chain, which is validated by these relay chain validators, these rounded rectangles here. And you can already see they are grouped. We call such a group a backing group. And each backing group is responsible for securing a shard, a parachain. So, this is a parachain, F. And these are the collator nodes, which are external to the relay chain. They are not known by the relay chain. They could be anybody. And they are maintaining this parachain. Um, what this means, we will see in a bit. And they provide proof of validity, like think of it as a block, to the relay chain validators. So, and they will validate that this state transition is actually good. This works statelessly, which allows us to rotate these groups. So right now, these validators are responsible for parachain C. After a while, they will be rotated, and now they will be responsible for parachain B. And those guys would be validating blocks of parachain A. So first thing, what are these collators? Collators are nodes which are, well, operating the parachain. They maintain, a, oops. <laughs> they maintain a transaction pool, and they maintain state and storage for this parachain. And they do provide proofs, proofs of validity to the relay chain validators, to their currently assigned backing group. The risk we have with collators is liveness in a way that there needs to be at least one honest collator on the entire world to maintain the liveness of the parachain. If all of them would, well, delete their state, then the parachain would be dead. We don't rely on them for security. So let's have a closer look at this proof of validity. This is the part that the parachain collators 
will send to the relay chain validators. A typical implementation looks very much like an optimistic rollup, where you have a state proof of the actually accessed state in the block and the actual block data. Think of transactions manipulating that state. This state proof is checked against the last state root hash that is maintained in the relay chain, so it can be verified that all this data is correct. The interesting thing is that this is really just a typical implementation. The requirements the relay chain actually has on a POV, on a proof of validity, is nothing. It's just a blob. It's just a VAC of U8. What gives it meaning is the registered PVF, the registered parachain validation function. For a parachain, this is VASM code that is registered on the relay chain beforehand. And then the proof of validity, whatever it is, is passed into that function. And then the outputs like commitments and whether it is valid or not with regards to this registered function. So um, just because I think it's, it's interesting, how does a state proof look like? Um, so the thing is, we Relation validators cannot have the state of each and every parachain. Otherwise, we would not be sharded and could not scale. So these proofs are self-contained, and this is how it works. You have a state, and this is like Merkleized. And what you do is you include these parts of the state in the proof, which, which are touched in that block. And because you hash everything together to a root and leave out the paths you don't need and just include like the top hash of the subtree, you can verify that all these values that are provided indeed match the previous state without the relation value that is actually knowing that state. Again, this is very similar to what rollups do. OK, now we covered collators. And they have provided this proof of validity to the backing group. So what do they do? They validate it again. This can happen stateless. They just pass it to the parachain validation function and see whether it's valid. Typical size of these groups is like five validators. And as mentioned before, they're rotating. We do this for censorship persistence. So assuming these five validators are actually malicious, don't like a particular parachain, they can only censor them for a short period of time because then the next group takes over and the parachain is live again. Um, also interesting, maybe, how this is organized. We do have a list of all the currently active validators, which can change each, each session. And we shuffle it and assign, it, assign them to the groups. And then we also know in the relations the uh, group rotation frequency, so when it's changed. And by this, both collators and validators can determine at any given point in time which validators are currently responsible for which parachain. And again, in the relay chain, they see their keys, and they can look them up in a distributed hash table to get PIDs and IP addresses, and then they can connect and provide their um, proof of validities. So once they're validated, they will obviously sign a statement saying, OK, this is indeed valid, valid and distribute it. They also commit to an erasure route, which is going to be important in the next phase. And Eventually, these statements will be picked up by the block producer, put into a relay chain block, and now we say the candidate is backed on chain. Does it mean we have recorded on chain a proof that these validators say this is valid? And of course, they are incentivized to participate in this process. So that's how it looks like. Next phase, availability. Now we have statements from a few validators which say, this is good, but this doesn't help too much if we don't ensure that the data that they say is good is also available for others to check. So they are going now to start distributing erasure-coded chunks to all the validators in the networks. They split it up in the number of validators' chunks, and each validator gets one chunk, together with a Merkle proof with the root they committed to. So they can verify that their chunk actually corresponds to that data they committed to. Now, as if you remember the um, 
well, the picture I showed you earlier, we have lots of parachains. So what validators now do, they fetch these chunks, one chunk for each parachain. Once they have that, they assign a bit field where each bit corresponds to one parachain. And if they successfully fetch that chunk, they set this bit to one, if not zero, and sign that. Um, then, again, statements are gossiped, block producer puts them in a block, and the runtime counts all these ones. And if it finds that at least two thirds of the validators said it's there, they have their chunk, we say the candidate became available, it's now included. We have a proof that it is indeed available with our two third honest assumption. So this is how it looks like. It's a bit vague. Each one means I have this validator has the chunk for this parachain. And in this particular case, it's the validator zero in the session. And yeah, we have its signature. Good. Now, we have just a few validators, maybe only two of them, actually said this is good. This is not good enough, obviously. So we have now that we have this commitment and the data available, we have another phase where we pick 30 additional random checkers via a verifiable random function. Um, they will assign themselves and say, OK, I don't trust you guys. I will check that as well. The key component here is that's not by the time the candidate is backed, nobody knows that, or at least the backers can't know all the approval checkers will, which will assign themselves afterwards. So what do they do? They recover the availability, recover the proof of validity, and validate it, and then either they approve or they dispute. If they dispute, the whole thing is escalated and all validators will check. Supermajority decides, and if the supermajority decides it's indeed invalid, then the backing validators will lose their complete stake. Good. We see it's enough if one validator disputes. So the assumption is that within these 30 randomly picked checkers, there will be at least one honest guy. That's enough for the protocol to work, because this guy will raise a dispute, everybody's checking, and offenders will get slashed. The likelihood of this being the case is extremely high, obviously not 100%, but very high. And the backers don't know beforehand. So they need to gamble, right? Maybe all my friends are going to be the people, maybe not. And if not, I'm losing all my funds, right? So we have a property here called Gambler's Ruin. They could try, but statistically, by the time they would succeed, they definitely ran out of funds even if they had all the money in the world. But that's only theoretic. In practice, what they could be doing, OK, there's indeed just one honest guy. Let's just DOS them. Let's DOS this guy. And then it doesn't show, and they are good and got the invalid stuff through. To prevent this, we have DOS protection. Simply explained, at this point, we know who the approval checkers are. And if they then don't show up and don't give us their approval, the protocol will cover them with more validators. So basically, you shut one guy down, you get two more checking. And with this, we secure and fast. Fast in this, I mean, OK. Um, so uh, fast when it comes to finality. We can be have quick, relatively quick finality, just a couple of blocks, while also being secure. So quickly through the summary. summary. We are highly scalable, full heterogeneous, and have sharding because of sharding. Um, the staked validators, which bring the economic security, are actually responsible. They will lose their money if any shard is, does something invalid. By this, we are secure, and we have fast finality. Now, oh, and an interesting um, thing also. Finality is quite fast, but inter-shard, inter communication is actually even faster, because they don't have to wait for finality. Because if something bad was ever found, all the shards would be rolled back. So they can immediately act on messages of, of other parachains. OK. Now, in comparison, an optimistic, well, it's optimistic. I just showed you like the pipeline we have. It's actually very pessimistic. We don't even trust our highly staked validators. 
What this means, for one, we have long times to finality. And also, security, it's at least hard to reason about, I would say. And also interesting, how is interroll of communication going to work with this long finality? And also, if you, if you assume that a single rollup can be trusted because maybe you are validating yourself, so I trust this, the moment you add communication between rollups, you would also need to check all the other rollups you're communicating with to be really sure, right? So that, that's interesting. And to really like, show, show the differences here, what's interesting is if we approached with Polkadot parachain consensus what rollups do, we could have 3,000 parachains running today, which would result in, in a few millions, at least, transactions per second. So let's look what a rollup looks like from the perspective of parachain consensus. We don't have backing. We don't have approvals, which is a very costly and complex part of the protocol. We do have some form of disputes. And obviously, because we don't have approvals, we also don't have any dust protection, which leads to the long finality. We do have availability because it's necessary, but it's not sharded. And indeed, if you look at it, the base layer, the layer one for a rollup has does nothing, really, in the, in the, well, in the optimistic case, right? If no, if no one disputes, the only thing that's provided by the base layer is the availability. And that's also the only thing that um, is a scaling limitating, limit, limitation in rollups right now, is that the availability is not sharded. OK, so I claimed if we approach this with parachain consensus, we could do 3,000 parachains. Why do I say this? Well, we would scratch approvals, which is the most heavy part of our protocol. We would lose dust protection, and we could numb down backing to just one validator. If we opened our disputes to external nodes, which just have to place some funds on the chain, as Ethereum does, and then everybody can dispute, and we will just have one validator. So what does this mean for the mainnet? It means we only, instead of 35 validators, 30 approving, recovering availability, doing the validation, signing signatures, and we have to check signatures. We would only have one validator, one validation, no availability recovery, which is at least a factor of 30. So right now we are about um, on testnet at around 100 parachains with 12 second block times. So with this, we could easily go with 3,000 parachains. So, this is interesting because it's, it's so, such a different angle to approach things, right? At the one side, we have fast finality and easy to reason about security. And on the other side, you have, well, very good scalability. Um, so I found this really interesting when I learned about rollups, this, this totally different way of approaching things. If the security of rollups is good enough and, and works, then why are we doing this, <laughs> basically? Um, so, but we don't know that yet, at least I don't. So what's next? We don't plan on doing this for now. For now, that's good enough. Um, for now, we will look at improving our efficiency. So what we are currently testing on having, testing on a test network is asynchronous backing, which improves our throughput per parachain because the process can be pipelined and parachain blocks can be bigger, which means that the constant overhead we have through the full approval voting process will be lower with regards to the actual payload. Um, and on-demand parachains. Right now, you have to get a slot for like two years, and then you should, or at least can, produce a block every 12 seconds. If on-demand, for startups or chains that are not that heavy, they can actually only produce a block and only pay for a block, when they actually need to produce one. For example, if you can think of either early applications or applications which are mostly read-only, which only need to update like once in a while, then they will, hey, I need a block, they pay, produce a block, and that's it, which drastically reduces also the load on the, on the network. In the same vein is Agile Core Time. Gavin Wood later on will tell you more about that. And interesting, uh, interesting we are also experimenting right now with exploiting the generosity of our 
POVs, as I discussed earlier. So there will be some interesting stuff coming here. OK, um, that's pretty much it. Thanks. And yeah, I, I hope I have time for questions. Thank you.